We're going to turn to Psalm 119, verses 41 to 48. Psalm 119, verses 41 to 48. Now, Psalms is usually in the middle of your Bible. 119 is the biggest psalm. So then just look for the uh, little number 41. May your unfailing love come to me, Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then I can answer those who taunt me. But I, for I trust in your word. Never take your word of truth from my mouth, for I have put my hope in your laws. I will obey your law forever and ever. I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your, prospect, your, your precepts. I will speak of you, your statutes before kings and will not be put to shame, for I delight in your commands because I love them. I reach out for your commands, which I love, that I may meditate on your decrees. I want to talk to you today, and of course this is uh, Independence Day week, and um, I wanted to talk to you about freedom <coughs> for reasons more than just uh, the reason of our, uh, of our Independence Day weekend, but also because uh, freedom does not happen in a vacuum. It takes uh, certain aspects of life in order to have freedom. It takes certain aspects of life in order to maintain freedom. And these are things that we have to fight for every day. These are not things that come naturally. These are not things that are natural gifts for us. In order for us to have freedom, we have to work for it. We have to strive for it. But first of all, let's uh, examine what freedom really is. Freedom is, first of all, self-determination. Uh, in verse 46, uh, the psalmist says, <clears throat> the psalmist says, I will speak of your statutes before kings and will not be put to shame. Self-determination, if you are going to be a self-determined people, it will lead you to the point at which you are going to have to defend your right to self-determination. Self-determination is just deciding who you are going to be and then working towards that. Now, self-determination you may not feel is completely in danger, and it's not yet, but it will be as time goes on. It's one of the last things to go. Self-determination is that point at which we decide life is just too big for us, and so we hand it over to the government. When we do that, we lose our self-determination. Life is too big for you. And I have given up my self-determination, to be honest with you. But I've given it up to the Lord. I have told, I have told God in no, no unequal terms. I've said, God, you determine my future. You determine my every step. You determine my walk. And so in that respect, I have given up my self-determination. But what if the government or a government entity should step in and should tell me that I have to follow their plan for my life, not God's plan for my life? Then all of a sudden we're in a problem because I have used my self-determination intentionally to give that to the aspirations of God the Father. And I have told God in no, no unequal terms, I am going to follow your will for my life, including all of my important choices. And to my best ability as a young man, I did. But as time has gone on, I have realized more and more exactly how absolute that has got to be in order for me to claim to be a follower of Christ 
and to be that follower of Christ in the truest sense of the word. The next thing is mutual trust. In verse 45, we read this. I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought your precepts. How do we walk about in freedom if we don't have mutual trust? And how do we have mutual trust if we do not seek the precepts of God? The precepts of God have to do with uh, the golden rule, for instance. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Okay, That rule is not do unto others and then take off. Uh, it, it's, it's do unto others as, they would have, as you would have them do unto you. It's building a mutual trust with other people so that not only do they know that they can trust you, but you know that you can trust them. It's being able to walk out onto the sidewalk with your pet and enjoy the air and to be able to wave and say hi to a neighbor without wondering, if I pass this guy, is he going to stab me? If I pass this guy, is he going to beat me? There's some places in the cities right now where they're playing something called the knockout game. And the gang members will get together and as you're walking past, without any provocation, without any reason, and without any, uh, any uh, cause on your part, they will just reach out and hit you right square in the middle of the forehead. And the challenge is to try and knock somebody out. It's actually sent people to the hospital and some of them it's sent to the grave. And when you're in a situation like that, where you're in a city and you're walking down the street and you have no idea whether or not the guy that's passing you is going to suddenly pull out his fist and try and knock you out, mutual trust is disappearing. Mutual trust is something that, that uh, salesmen have robbed us of. When they are no longer able or willing to sell the product on the merits of the product, but are instead using psychology to try and trap you and trick you into buying something you don't have the money for or don't want, they're robbing us of mutual trust. When we find ourselves on our emails, and there's an email there, and it says that one of your loved ones is lost somewhere in Spain and needs you to send money. And yet you know your loved one's not in Spain. But this, was, this is taking advantage of mutual trust for personal benefit and ruining that trust. There cannot be freedom if there is not mutual trust. And sometimes the price of mutual trust is the overlooking of minor and small faults in each other. Sometimes the price of mutual trust is dealing with somebody whose personality is abrasive to you. Not asking people to be perfect in everything that they do, but just simply realizing that people are just human beings. And they can't be more than just human beings. For all of the teaching that we do about the morals of God and the, and the law of God and the character of God, you can't just wake up in the morning and decide to be holy. You can't just wake up in the morning and decide to be righteous. You can wake up in the morning and decide to pursue righteousness or to pursue holiness, but you cannot just wake up and suddenly be it because you are a mere human being. Last of all, private property. In Deuteronomy 27, 27 17, and I'm going to turn there because I want to get, I want to get it straight out of the scripture for you and not just paraphrase it because if I do you might say well he's making things up I don't want you to be put in that position because this is a very important scripture in 27 17 it says this cursed is anyone who moves their neighbor's boundary stone 
Cursed is anyone who moves their neighbor's boundary stone. This is one of the many laws that God made respecting the right of private property. Private property is extremely important. The borders of our nation are important. The borders of your neighbor's yard are important. Now, it may be that you and your neighbor having a good relationship and mutual trust and being self-determined might in freedom tolerate a little bit of an intrusion uh, you know, into each other's property line. But it would be absolutely wrong for you to build a shed on your neighbor's property and claim that as your property. Private property is essential to a free society. People must be able to stake out a place on this earth and say, this is my little square. This is my little land. This is my little place. And they should be able to, out of mutual trust, expect their neighbors not to use their property for their own gain and out of self-determination, expect that not only would their neighbors allow them to be self-determined, but they would allow their neighbors to be self-determined without the invasion of trust or property. These three things have got to exist in order for there to be freedom in any society. So what does freedom look like? It looks like self-determination. I have self-determined that I am going to follow Jesus Christ. It also is mutual trust. I have decided that because God has called me to win others to him, that the need for mutual trust between me and others is not as necessary as the need between, of mutual trust between me and God. Private property. I have also determined that all things belong to the Lord. Therefore, that property which God has given me, I have given it over to him to be the owner of it. And I myself am merely a steward. And I take good care as much as I can of my family and of, my, uh, and of whatever God has given me to take care of. Our church, uh, the property over there, the, uh, at the parsonage, I do the best that I can with what I'm given. So, but that all, though, is a free choice that I have made. And as a people who are coming to the Lord this morning to hear from him, I encourage you, use these things that he has given you and make a free choice to serve God. So where does freedom come from? Well, freedom comes from, first of all, self-government. In uh, verse 44 of Psalm 119, and I have to turn back there because I do not have a bookmark sitting there. And I don't do bookmarks only because if I'm turning in Scripture, you're probably turning in Scripture, and it gives us both time to get there. But I will always obey your law forever and ever, says David. I will always obey your law forever and ever. David is making a self-determined choice to obey the law of God because he understands that we never will be a free people until we are a self-governed people. I've said this to my kids before when I've been bringing them up. And what I've said to my kids is, I've said, govern yourself or else other people will step in and govern you. Whenever my children have been, have, have been uh, out of sorts, whenever they have let their emotions get control of them and run them into places that they should not have gone, whether it is into arguments or whether it is into choices that they were making with their life that needed to be stopped. And by the way, when, if you're a Christian parent and you've got a kid and your kid is making a bad choice, it is the most wrong thing that you can do to just throw your hands up in the air and say, well, I've got to let them make their own choices. No, they're your child. Step in, stop them from making a bad choice. 
And when you stop them from making a bad choice and they're mad at you, you talk to them and you say to them, listen, either you govern yourself or other people are going to govern you. And that is the absolute truth. Folks, if you don't step in, if your neighbors don't step in, if the children in our high school, if the children in our, our elementary schools, our middle school, if they do not govern themselves, it puts the onus to govern them on other people. We were talking just the other day about when I was a kid. I had a class of 32 kids, one teacher. Do you know how much trouble that one teacher had with us, us 32 kids? This is how much trouble she had. Okay, everybody sit down. And we all sat down. The end. Why? Because most of us knew if we misbehaved at school, then when we went home and our parents got the call from the teacher, we were going to be in trouble. And so we behaved at school because we didn't want to be in trouble at home. These days, kids misbehave at school. They call home, and the parents say, well, they're your, trouble, you're your problem when they're at school. They're your problem when they're at school. It's your job to govern them when they're at school. And the parents will go in and will argue with the teacher when their own child has done the wrong thing in order to stay on their kid's side. They're not teaching self-government, which is why self-government is causing uh, political government to grow. That lack of self-government is causing political government to grow. We can do our part to save ourselves from losing our freedom, our self-determination, our mutual trust, and our private property by governing ourselves and governing ourselves well. If we want to maintain freedom, self-government is extremely important. The other thing that is important is truth. In verse 43, David writes this. He says, Never take your word of truth from my mouth, for I have put my hope in your laws. If we are going to be a free people, we need truth. Truth is what generates freedom as much as self-government because we cannot self-govern without proper information. And right now, any of us here could, could easily tell stories of what we're seeing in the news. In the news right now, what we are seeing is a breakdown of truth in exchange for opinion. And it doesn't matter what news agency you go to, even Fox, which a lot of people trust, because it's all opinion. Opinion, 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 opinion. And a little bit of truth. We need truth if we are going to have freedom. This is why the Bible was the first book printed when the movable type printing press was developed by Gutenberg. He knew that printing the Bible was the key to freedom because the Bible is truth. Unadulterated truth, not full of errors, not a few errors, absolutely truthful in everything that it tells us. And because it is absolutely truthful, we can bank our life on it. And we can know that if we follow the Bible, that what it says will come to pass. First of all, all of its prophecies that it has given so far have come to pass. And we know that the prophecies that have not yet come to pass are to come to pass in the future. And so we await those. We know that if the Bible has said, do this, do that, and do that, and God will do this, do that, and do that in exchange, it's always happened that way. We have witnesses here today that can say they have seen answers to prayer. 
We have witnesses here today that can say they have seen healings that the doctors do not understand and could not explain. We have witnesses here today that know that when they have asked God for something, he has miraculously and sometimes very surprisingly supplied you with that need. There are testimonies all over this room. Can you raise your hand if you're one of those people I just mentioned? Let me see those hands. Look at that. Look at that. A lot of hands. A lot of hands. There is, there is nobody here that has not either been impacted by an answer to prayer in somebody else's life or impacted by an answer to prayer in their own life. Because the Bible is true. God is real. Jesus is his Savior given to us for us. Last of all, diligence. In verse 48, we read this. I reach out for your commands, which I love, that I may meditate on your decrees. It takes diligence to continually reach out for the commands of God, to continually ask God, what do you want me to do today, God? What do you need me to do today, God? To read your Bible every day, to pray every day, to do the things that generate freedom, it takes diligence. And if you do not have self-government truth and diligence, you do not have freedom. Because everything that you brought to life yesterday started to die. Every child that is born has begun their clock ticking off to their death. I know that sounds gruesome, but that is absolutely the truth. Every garden plant that you have planted is ticking away its life until it has borne its fruit and died. Every little puppy, every tree, every plant, every flower, Everything that is brought to life, as soon as it is brought to life, it begins ticking off the moments until it dies. Because we live in a world where death and decay are the order of things. And if we do not fight to keep things alive, fight to keep ourselves alive, fight to keep our families alive, fight to keep our businesses alive, fight to keep our plants growing. If we do not fight the course of things, then death will come prematurely to those things that we care about. And it takes diligence in order to keep breathing life back into everything, including our freedom. And so diligence, truth, and self-government are where freedom comes from. When you govern yourself, nobody has to govern you, so nobody is, has to step into your life and take it over. When you are, are self-governing because you have truth, then there is nobody that can trip you up, nobody that can trick you, and nobody that can taunt you and make you do the wrong thing. And when there is diligence, you are constantly fighting and pushing in order to keep life breathed into all of the things that matter, especially your freedom. So last of all, where does freedom happen? It happens, first of all, within God's uh, favor and love. In verses 41 and 42, we read that. If you want to have real freedom, freedom that will last, not freedom that is going to die, but freedom that will last, you must find God's favor for your life. God's favor comes upon you through Jesus Christ. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you are walking in a faithful relationship with Jesus Christ, then you will be a free person, even if you are in chains. Paul and Silas were put into jail in Philippi because they were preaching the word of God. And they were falsely accused of something. And here they are in chains. And in chains, Paul and Silas are looking at each other. And they're, having, they're, they're talking about the goodness of God. And, and how privileged they are to be in chains for his sake, for the sake of the truth, for the sake of their own self-government. 
for the sake of their freedom, they are in chains. And they are saying to themselves, wow, what a great opportunity to serve God. And the Bible says that they got, in, they got so happy, they started to sing a song that they knew, a hymn to God and a song of praise. And as they began singing this song, and just so full of the Spirit, and just so happy with these iron bands on their arms, and chains chaining them down to this dank, stinky dungeon, the Bible says the Holy Spirit began to respond to their faithfulness and to their love and joy that they found in serving God, so much so that the Spirit of God filled that building and the building shook and their chains fell off physically. Not just spiritually, physically, they fell off. And the doors went off of the hinges and anybody could have left. And when the Philippian jailer came in, the Bible says he took a look and he saw the condition of the building. He saw all those gates and, and doors off their hinges and he knew he was going to be executed for letting those prisoners free. And so he got out his sword and he was about ready to run himself through. And Paul said, whoa, 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 don't do yourself any harm. We're all still here. That means even the other prisoners that didn't even know God, they were still there. Why? Because the presence of God was there. When the favor of God and the love of God are upon you, even people who don't know God just want to be around you. And we were sharing just a little bit ago in our prayer time that there was that there was an unbeliever that was asking for prayer from our church, and we just prayed for her. But the more important thing that we need to be praying for is that she would become a believer. That's even more important. And we need to keep that in our minds and in our hearts. When we're hearing somebody say, an unbeliever, somebody who doesn't know the Lord, somebody who... Folks, there are so many people that need to know the Lord. And any time God gives you the opportunity to open your mouth and speak, speak. Take advantage of every opportunity. God's favor and love, if they are on you, he'll break those chains. Even if you're still in the physical chains, he can break the chains off of your heart. Within the boundaries of the spirit of his law, the, the freedom happens. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, the letter of the law brings death, but the Spirit brings life. We can't live up to the letter of the law of God, but we can live up to the Spirit of the law. The Spirit that is behind that law is the Holy Spirit, the one that He gave to you and I. And we can live up to that Spirit because He gives us power to do so. The Bible says that when we give our hearts to the Lord, the holiness of God and the righteousness of God are imputed to us. That means we didn't earn it, but God's going to give it to us anyways. Just like a, a poor girl that marries a millionaire gets to lead a millionaire's life, even though she didn't earn it. The only reason that she does is because the millionaire loved her and brought her into his life. So also... We sinners, full of sin, steeped in sin from birth, can live the benefits of a righteous and a holy life, not because we ourselves earned it, but because Jesus, who loves us, has brought us to, close to himself in a relationship. So then last of all, at each command he gives, 47 and 48, we read that, that we are to look for his commands, follow his commands. What does that mean? That means when God says to you, hey, I need you to phone call somebody. I need you to send a card. I need you to talk to that person. When you're, when you're talking with somebody at the grocery store, and I've told you guys this before, and there's been a couple of times I almost messed up. But if you're at the grocery store or you're out and about 
and somebody tells you that they got something going on in their life. Oh, my sister is sick. Oh, my... God should get a hold of your heart and tell you, man, stop right where you are. Put your hand on their shoulder and pray for them. Right out there in public with everybody watching. Why? Because I'm trying to make a show. No, because once you leave that moment, once you go away from that moment, you may forget to pray. And how do they know that you prayed? They have no idea whether you did or not. You could say, yeah, I prayed for you. You could be lying. How do they know? Stop and pray for them right there and then so they know you prayed. I pray for people on the phone. When people say, ah, oh, such and such a problem, the Lord gets a hold of my heart and I say, let's pray for this right here on the phone. Let's take care of this right now. You'd be surprised how following the commands that God gives your heart can bring freedom into your relationship. Freedom happens when you've got God's favor and love on your life. Freedom happens when you're in the boundaries of the spirit of his law. Freedom does not happen outside of the boundaries of the Holy Spirit. And last of all, freedom happens when you follow his commands because he tells you what to do so that the spirit of eternal life can be breathed back into everything that you are doing on this side of heaven where death and decay are constantly at work to tear apart everything that you love and know. What are you going to do this Independence Day with your freedom? Are you just going to enjoy it and expect that it will be there again tomorrow? Is there always going to be a 4th of July parade? And if there isn't always going to be a 4th of July parade, shouldn't you enjoy the ones that we do have so that they'll keep doing them? Shouldn't we do everything we can to not just enjoy the freedom that God has given us, but to preserve it as well?